Hello, hello. Thank you for tuning in today. I have five different questions that I received from you all. I'll be answering questions about screen time, how to better understand the middle childhood years, elementary school age kids, getting rid of toys and art when you feel overwhelmed, power struggles and sibling challenges. If you have a question that you'd like to submit, go to speakpipe.com forward slash simple families. And I'll use some of those questions for future episodes. Hi, this is Danae. I'm the founder of Simple Families. Simple Families is an online community for parents who are seeking a simpler, more intentional life. In this show, we focus on minimalism with kids, positive parenting, family wellness, and decreasing the mental load. My perspectives are based in my firsthand experience raising kids, but also rooted in my PhD in child development. So you're going to hear conversations that are based in research, but more importantly, real life. Thanks for joining us. Before we jump into this episode, I do want to give you a little framework for which I answer these questions. I'm not offering official medical or professional advice. I'm simply giving you some thoughts that come to mind for me when I hear these questions. Some things that have worked for my family, some things that may or may not work for yours. As always, take what works for you and leave what doesn't. Hi, Danae. My name is Emily, and I have four children, age 11 months up to eight years. And my question is about screen time, not for the kids, but for the grownups, um, for grandparents specifically. Uh, we have um, uh, four grandparents, and while they don't live locally, they're very in- involved in our lives, which we love. Um, And I find that oftentimes when they're up visiting for the weekend, it seems that they're always on their phone. There have been times where I've kind of looked out and I've seen all four grandparents here visiting and all four are just absorbed in their phone um, while they're around the kids. And I've been struggling with um, if and how to address this because I think it's something that people can feel attacked about and um, I, I don't want to put them on the defense. At the same time, I really am wanting to set a good example with screen time. And I'm also wanting um, to make sure that nobody is missing out on special moments because we're all looking at stuff on the phone. Um, So I'm hoping you might have some great advice for me. Thanks so much. Emily, this is a great question and you're not alone. I don't think there are any humans of any age that are immune from getting sucked into their phones. So I think it's first and foremost important to normalize it. We've all been there. But I also understand why you would like to see things happening a little bit different. As with most things, it's much easier to change our own behavior than it is to change the behavior of others, whether that's your kids or your parents or your siblings or your friends. So I encourage you to stay in your own lane. What do I mean by that? Start by making change yourself. Start by making change within your home. One thing that I've done with my kids in my house is that I've told them, if you feel like I'm distracted by my phone and you need my attention, feel free to ask me to put my phone down. Now, not everybody's going to be comfortable with that, but I appreciate having a little bit of accountability because sometimes it happens beyond my awareness. Now, if I'm doing something that absolutely has to be done, and I'm on a deadline or something like that, then I'll tell them, I need five more minutes, and then you can have my attention. But as a rule of thumb, I try to limit my phone to things that can be done quickly. I'm rarely ever on my phone typing out a 45-minute report or writing an article. So the things on my phone are generally short in duration, and it's pretty easy to wrap it up and put it away. So if you do make your kids a bit of an accountability partner, they're probably going to start holding the grandparents accountable too, for better or worse. And that could help if your kids were advocating. Hey, grandma. Hey, grandpa. Can you finish up on your phone and come play with me? Now, it is important to loop the grandparents into this conversation and explaining to them before they come over, you know, We've been working on scaling back on how much time we're on our phones in front of the kids. It's really helped in how we engage with them and how much we enjoy them. 
or a neutral statement, kind of like that. I think often our kids are kind of immune to seeing adults on their phones. I remember that we had a babysitter that I suspected was on her phone a lot when she was with the kids. And I asked the kids, I said, you know, was she on her phone a lot? And one of them said, yeah, she was doing work. And and that kind of made me laugh because I'm like, well, her work is taking care of you. So I don't think she was doing her work. No, I didn't say that, of course. Um, But it just made me conscious of this idea that they don't really know what we're doing on our phones. And sometimes they just assume everything that we're doing is important. And I don't know about you, but certainly for me, not everything that I'm doing on my phone is important. Not everything I'm doing on my phone has to be done urgently. And reflecting on that is important. I think as adults, we have this increased sense of urgency to respond really quickly to things on our phones and reflecting may help us to realize that we don't actually have to do that. If you haven't already listened to my two analog curious episodes where I talk more about scaling back an adult screen time, you could tune in there at simplefamilies.com forward slash episode 302 and simplefamilies.com forward slash episode 303. So kind of the quick and dirty answer to this is that I think first you need to stay in your own lane and start practicing it at home and changing the expectations of your kids at home so they start to notice when the adults are on their phone if they have kind of become immune to that. Maybe even helping to make them your accountability partners. And then introducing the idea to the grandparents in a way where you're really taking ownership over it. It's not attacking them. It's you We are trying to make changes at home. This is what we are doing differently and hoping that they'll pick up on some of the cues for that. And if they don't, in many ways, this is going to be their loss, their loss of quality time spent with their grandkids. And at the end of the day, that's not really within your control. Hi, Danae. My kids are six and nine, so we have left behind that early childhood window. And that's really the area that I feel more comfortable with. It's what my background is in. Um, I just feel like I'm much more knowledgeable about child development in that stage than in these kind of middle years that they're in right now. I was just wondering if you have any recommendations on resources, books, um, anything that might help me to better understand the unique challenges and developmental stages of these ages now that we are in the elementary school years. Thank you. This is a great question, and you aren't alone in this. I know that there are so many books that help us to understand toddler behavior and infant development, but as our kids get older, there seems to be less. I think part of that is because parents get more comfortable and more confident in their role and don't feel the need to check in with a book to see if their kid is developing on time. Now, I don't think by any means that we stop asking ourselves the age-old question of, is this normal? Are other kids this age doing this? Not only are there fewer books and educational resources on the topic, but I think we're talking about this less with our peers and friends too. When they were toddlers, it wasn't unusual for us to problem solve with friends and say, oh, is your kid having tantrums too? What are you doing? How is potty training going? Is your kid a picky eater? Mine is. But as they get older, we don't feel as comfortable doing that. You probably have fewer friends who you'd be comfortable asking, does your kid still wet the bed? Does your eight-year-old still have tantrums? Is your 10-year-old afraid to sleep alone at night? And as a result of the lack of educational resources available and the lack of that open conversation during this age range, we can often feel alone. And the truth of the matter is there really is no quote unquote normal. All kids are still developing at their own rates. But I will go over some of the major developmental tasks, the things that they're working on during these elementary school years. Although I do think this could probably be an episode in and of itself. So in the field of child development, we have a lot of child development theories, and they're all a little bit different. Some resonate more with us than others. Some resonate for different reasons. So I'm going to tell you just a little bit about two. The theory of moral development by Kohlberg and the theory of social development by Erickson. 
Now, Erickson stages are actually the stages of psychosocial development, but I think it's much more approachable if we just say social development. So Kohlberg looked at how do our kids develop moral reasoning or moral thinking. Kohlberg believed that in the early years, kids didn't have their own personal code of morality. Instead, their decisions on what was wrong or right, what they should be doing, was based on the standards of adults, what they were told, which is basically where reward and punishment was established, this idea that if an action leads to punishment, it must be bad. If it leads to reward, it must be good. So when we assume that kids didn't have this internal sense of good and bad, that we needed to use these rewards and punishments to show them what was good and what was bad. So that led us to this belief that kids often make moral decisions based on the consequences. And now when I say rewards and punishments, it's not so literal as like you're going to get put in time out or you're going to get a reward chart out. We are naturally rewarded and punished all the time. So if I meet a new person and I say something wildly inappropriate to them, they're probably not going to call me to hang out again. That's a punishment. They're withdrawing their affection and their interest towards me. And on the flip side, if I go out and meet a friend for coffee and that friend really enjoys my company, they say, let's do this again. And they initiate another interaction. That's a reward. And through that, I know that the way that I behaved was either good or bad. Nobody said, Danae, you did a good job talking to that friend today, or Danae, you did a bad job talking to that friend today. Instead, I was able to deem whether my behavior was appropriate based on the response of the others around me. And in that way, when we think about rewards and punishments like that, our kids are rewarded and punished all the time. And so are we as adults. So in the earliest years, kids haven't yet made these strong associations with what they should and what they shouldn't be doing. And as they reach middle childhood, they start to get a grasp on that as far as what they should and shouldn't be doing from society's perspective. So you'll probably start to see more conformity because if our kids are constantly being rewarded and punished for their social behavior and the way they're interacting with others and the way they're interacting at home, they're starting to figure out what the expectations are from the world. And they're internalizing those expectations. And related to this is this idea of how do we set kids up to have success in the world? not complete 100% success because they need to learn how to fail and get back up again. But if you have a kid that you feel like just keeps faltering over and over, whether it's behavior at school or interpersonal relationships, how can you help to create some opportunities for success for that type of kid? Here's an example for this. My free-spirited child, she plays the violin. And if I put her into a violin class where the teacher had these very rigid expectations, like first you're going to come in and play this song and then this song and then this song, and then we're done. She would not react well to that because she likes to freestyle and improv and do her own thing. And while she needs opportunities to practice going with the grain, she also needs plenty of space to be able to go against it. So her teacher is absolutely wonderful. They usually spend about half the class doing the things that they need to do for successful music education. And then the other half, having fun, flipping the violin on its side, playing it like a fiddle, or improving and making up her own songs. If I had put her into the former situation where she had these really rigid high expectations of her, she wouldn't be able to be successful and she'd end up feeling like crap about herself and that would negatively impact her self-esteem. So I need to make sure to give her a lot of wiggle room, literal wiggle room to wiggle because even though she is, you know, in these middle childhood years now where there are more expectations on her to adhere to the social order of society, I do want her to have some room to step outside the box. And on the flip side of that, my rule-following kid, I have to really encourage to step outside the box because he very much understands those social expectations and what he should and shouldn't be doing. Now, that's my own belief set 
there is that I want my kids to understand the social expectations of society, but also be able to step outside of that box and to forge their own path. And sometimes that does mean questioning my authority, not viewing me as this infallible role model because I'm not, and nor do I want to set up that expectation for them. So now moving on to another theory, which is Erickson's psychosocial theory. This stage, the elementary school years, focuses on competency. The real task for them is to understand what they're capable of, to feel confident in their ability to achieve goals, to take initiative. And as parents, we can set them up with opportunities to do things for themselves, to feel proud of those things they're doing for themselves, to notice when power struggles are popping up because they are a sign that our kids need a little more control and a little more power over their lives. And I personally think that this age range, these elementary school years, are characterized mostly by power struggles because we, as the parents, are still trying to figure out how to pass along that power to our kids a little bit at a time when they're ready for it. And sometimes we hold on to it a little longer than we need to. If you haven't listened to my episode on power struggles yet, you can find that at simplefamilies.com forward slash episode 282. Now, of course, we have more obvious opportunities to hand over the power during a power struggle because often we know exactly what the power our kids are looking for is. But there are plenty of other opportunities for our middle childhood kids to go deeper on this real work of competency. Here's a great example. This weekend, I was on the gala committee for my son's school. That meant I had to go early and set up the chairs and the tables and the tablecloths. The event was just for adults, but I brought him with me to set up. And he was such a huge help. He was scrubbing chairs. He was spreading tablecloths. He was carrying flower arrangements and placing them on the tables, setting up the table numbers. He was doing real impactful work. And he felt so, so good about it. He was so proud of his contributions, as he should have been. This was so important to him because it really helped develop that sense of competency. I remember as a kid, I had the chore that I had to vacuum the living room carpet and I did a pretty crap job of it. And my mom always had to go back over it and do it after I did it. So that's an example of not developing competency in our kids. So if you find yourself doing that, if you give them tasks and then you're not happy with the outcome and then you do it yourself, find a different task. Find tasks that you know that your child is very capable of accomplishing, things you're not going to have to go back and fix. Keep it simple and make sure they know you see them. That night when my husband and I got to the event, I took lots of pictures of the tables when they were completely ready with the people sitting at them and he could really see the fruits of his labor. And by the way, I'm still really bad at vacuuming. My mom would probably still re-vacuum my floor if I let her and it just might need it. Before I get into the next few questions, I'm going to pause for a two minute word from today's sponsors. Our first sponsor for today is Shopify. If you run an online business, then you probably appreciate that sound too. It's the sound of another sale on Shopify, which is an all-in-one commerce platform to start, run, and grow your business. Shopify gives entrepreneurs the resources once reserved for big businesses. So startups, upstarts, and established businesses alike can sell everywhere. They can synchronize online and in-person sales and effortlessly stay informed. I love how Shopify has the tools and resources that make it easy for any business to succeed, from down the street to around the globe. Like mine, Shopify powers millions of businesses from first sale to full scale. Go to shopify.com slash simple, all lowercase, for a free 14-day trial and get access to Shopify's entire suite of features. Grow your business with Shopify today. Go to shopify.com slash simple, right now. Shopify.com slash simple. Our second sponsor for today is Indeed. Is hiring challenging? Yes. Do you love a challenge? Also, yes. You need a hiring partner that can help you rise to the challenge. You need Indeed. Indeed is the hiring platform where you can attract, interview, and hire all in one place. So instead of spending hours on multiple job sites searching for candidates with the right skills, Indeed is a powerful hiring partner that can help you do it all, simply. 
which is what I love the most. Find great talent faster through time-saving tools like the Indeed Instant Match, assessments, and virtual interviews. So start hiring now with a $75 sponsored job credit to upgrade your job post at indeed.com slash families. This offer is good for a limited time. Claim your $75 credit now at indeed.com slash families. Indeed.com slash families. Terms and conditions apply. Pay per qualified applicant is not available to all users. If you need to hire, you need Indeed. Thanks again for supporting our sponsors. They help to keep this show in business. Now back to my questions. Yeah, I had a question about um, getting rid of toys and stuff. I listened to one of your podcasts where you talk about having your kids ask a question to themselves of, is it beautiful and is it useful when considering getting rid of a possession? And what if um, the possession, for example, a broken straw, my daughter will say it's useful because she wants to use it for a future craft project, but then months will go by and she hasn't actually used it. Or she'll say, it's so special to me, but she has many things that are so special to her. So what do you do in those situations when you're trying to help your child pare down her possessions? Thank you so much. It's funny because now I've been podcasting for five years and I not infrequently have these moments where people say, well, Danae, you said this. And I'm like, are you sure? Are you sure that was me? (laughs) I'm having one of those moments right now. Um, Are you sure I said that? I probably did. Or some variation of that. And that is delightful and very respectful. And if I can be perfectly honest, that is not how I operate all the time. Because if it's some kind of straw or piece of very obvious trash, I'm just going to throw that away. I, and probably like many of you listening, don't have the time, energy, or mental bandwidth to present my child with every little trinket and piece of paper and rock and pebble and ask him or her if it sparks joy. Would that be the most respectful type of parenting? Probably. But what would happen to me is I would lose my mind. And keeping my mind is really important in keeping calm. So there are some decisions that I make and things that I do that are really for the betterment of the whole family. And throwing away pieces of crap, that's on that list. I don't ask. I just do it. Now, those questions are more for significant items, right? So if it is a toy they got for Christmas six months ago and they've barely touched, maybe I'll ask some questions to get them to contemplate, think deeper about it and be more intentional about letting it go. But generally speaking, no. You know, if we have a broken mousetrap game, a deck of cards that's missing half the kings, a pocket full of rocks, I just let it go, like into the garbage, back into nature. And maybe that's not the perfect response, but my kids still love me, and I still love them, and I think we're going to be okay. I'm not striving to be perfect. I'm striving to stay sane and happy and healthy. And to do that, I just can't banter with my children over every little thing. So that's, that's where I'm going with that one. Hi, Danae. I just read your article about tossing artwork, and we mostly employ that strategy, which is very helpful. What I find totally crushing and irritating are the in-progress projects. I love how creative my nine-year-old is, and I totally hate it. She's constantly got a new project going on, and because she doesn't finish them promptly, they're always cluttering up the table, the kitchen, her room. Also, she sets up long-term play scenes, which is so cool. A pottery shop, different houses made of boxes for her characters, a doctor's office, a photography studio. It's kind of nuts. How do I nurture her creativity without her running me out of the house? Thank you. Wow, how these questions are so related, these last two. So very much kind of on the same note, you know, freedom within limits. I love creativity. I absolutely encourage creativity in my kids especially this kind of creativity, but within limits. If it is driving you nuts, if you are losing your mind, if it's impacting your ability to stay calm, 
You find your irritability creeping up because of all the stuff accumulating, even if it is really creative, fun stuff. Then yes, boundaries are necessary. I would probably limit it to like three, three ongoing projects and find some way to make physical parameters for it. You could get like those foam squares where you could have one project on each square. And when a new project comes into play, you have to recycle or throw away the one that was in progress before. Some kind of physical parameters. If it's small, you could have like one shoebox per project and have three shoeboxes. But you are allowed to set limits and you need to set limits because without the limits, you're going to be crazy. And I am going to go out on a limb and say that some of these ongoing projects are probably just things that your kid doesn't really want to clean up. So if it's like the pottery wheel that they have made out of cardboard and you say, oh, you know what? I think we should probably throw away the pottery wheel. You've got a lot of projects going. And then all of a sudden they're playing with the pottery wheel. So they're kind of pulling out that last minute rescue, which kids do a lot with toys. Just because your kid has 25 projects in the works right now, doesn't mean that their creativity or their self-worth is going to be harmed if you decide they only get to have 10 or whatever it is they can have. There's still a lot of room to innovate when you have limits and boundaries. And it just feels like a really important life lesson too, because your kid is always going to be sharing space, right? They're going to leave your house. They're going to go off to college and share a dorm room. Maybe they'll get married or have a life partner that they're sharing a house with. They'll have kids they're sharing space with. They need to practice being respectful of spaces, especially shared spaces. And they need to practice understanding that their stuff has an impact on others. And when their stuff is a hot mess, it impacts other people. They don't live within this vacuum. So it for sure sounds like time to set some limits and parameters on how many creations she can have. Danae, with summer break coming up, I'm worried that my kids are going to spend most of it fighting. I've appreciated your talks in the past about expansion and contraction, and I'm just wondering if you could elaborate more on that in terms of the summer coming and kids being at home and up in each other's business at all times. Thank you. Yeah, so um, that's what my kids are going to be doing this summer too. Sounds familiar. They are going to be fighting a lot this summer. That's their work, right? The sibling relationship is laying the groundwork for future intimate relationships in years to come. And intimate relationships are messy, especially when you have one or two or three or four highly opinionated kids who have different worldviews and different ways of thinking. So yes, kids argue because they're practicing. Practicing problem solving and conflict management and resolution negotiation, all the things. So as a parent, we kind of come to this place where we're asking ourselves, how do we coexist with this fiery, rocky relationship? Are there things that we can do to ease it, to make it a little softer? Yes, of course, but it's never going to be perfect. Most sibling relationships feel rocky. So if you haven't had a primer on expansion and contraction, which is my best tool for managing sibling relationships, go to simplefamilies.com forward slash episode 233. I'll just give you kind of the quick and dirty here. So expansion and contraction is this idea that with intimate relationships, we often need to come together and spend that quality time. And then we need to separate and we need to breathe. And as adults, we tend to be able to feel our expansion and contraction needs and lean into those needs when they happen. Let's use the example of getting together with extended family over the holidays. You're so excited to see each other. You haven't seen each other in a long time and you contract. You're together on top of each other, maybe all staying in one house. And it's great until it's not and you need to expand and you need to go out and run to the grocery store or you need to go out and maybe get a hotel. So as adults, we're in tune with that. But our kids, they don't recognize it as much. So sometimes we need to prompt them to expand or to contract. And sometimes that means, hey, go run outside, get some fresh air, take some space, especially if you live somewhere small and they're in tight quarters inside. Or it also might look like, hey, go take some time in your bedrooms. 
not in a punitive way, just in a way that your kids need some expansion, which by the way, talking about this, I keep wanting to say extraction, which is like some combination of expansion and contraction, which may actually be a viable third option if you are having a really hard time with them. Just kidding. But watch for this dynamic to pop up with your kids because it will. And you can do your job to help them pivot and to recognize when they need one or the other. And maybe even prompt them to ask themselves what they need. I really like this concept because in some ways it takes the old go to your room idea and normalizes it and makes it okay. Yes, absolutely. Go to your room, take some space. I actually just went to my room and took some space last night. That's healthy, not punitive. So we will be expanding a lot this summer, probably expanding more than contracting, but a healthy balance of the two. The most valuable part of this tool is really shifting your mindset that this sort of bickering and arguing is normal and helping to make space for it and helping to make space for them to find some time apart is also healthy and normal. Doesn't mean that you're failing. And a lot of times when kids argue, that's what parents tend to think that they've done something wrong or that they need to do something different in order to make this relationship really thrive. And again, there are things we can do to help support the sibling relationship, but that's more than we're talking about here today in the podcast. All right. So that wraps up my five questions for today. Thank you all for submitting them. If you want to submit for future episodes, go to speakpipe.com forward slash simple families. Enrollment for the community is still open. Go to simplefamilies.com forward slash community. It's been so great getting to know many of you there. So join us. It's only $10 a month. You get live interaction with me and all of our wonderful, amazing community members. When you have a minute, leave a rating or review for this show. I know I asked that last week and I actually got quite a few with that request. So if you didn't do it last week, please do it this week. I am really going for a thousand reviews. And I think at the time of recording, I have like 964. So help me hit that mark, please, please. All right. Thanks for tuning in. Have a good one. And I will chat with you next week.